Christ is the Cure. This is Nick, and I'm going to be your host today as we continue our little journey through Philippians. Um, this will be the last one touching on Philippians, uh, and this will be on Philippians 3, 1 through 11, and I think it kind of rounds off the discussions we've been having pretty well, and I just really enjoy this passage now that I know the background and the context, and so um, we're going to go into that. But before we do, I want you to check this out. Make your plans now to join us for the G3 National Conference, September 30th through October 2nd, as we'll gather for Christian fellowship and the worship of God through song and the preached word. Our theme for the 2021 conference will be centered on biblical Christology. You can find registration details at g3men.org. Get 15% off by mentioning code G3JT. That's G3JT. So many of you guys know about G3. It's a big theological conference in Georgia. And uh, this year, they're talking about Christology, as I said, which is pretty awesome. And I'm happy to say that I'll be able to attend for the first time this year if all plans stay the normal course. So go ahead and go check out the details for that, and maybe I'll see you there. So today, we're going to be talking about Philippians 3, 1 through 11. And um, we're not going to go over all of the extensive background that we went over um, prior, which was in episode 160. So if you want to hear... More extensive background, check out the first half of episode 160. So if you want to, open up your Bibles to Philippians 3, and we'll read through it, and then we'll talk about it. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write these same things to you is of no trouble to me, and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory, in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisees, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness underneath the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Um... So a brief look at context, right? We always want to talk about context. Um, Philippians 3, 1 through 11 seems to kind of be a weird sidebar within the text. It's, it's just kind of, it seems kind of random. Um, but despite these first glances, it actually moves along the text by honing in on the preeminence of Christ, which we've talked about in the previous episodes, um, the advancement of the Philippians in the faith, and addressing issues that the Philippians had faced and needed a reminder of, right? So, Paul transitions to this section to warn the Philippians against those who would um, put them underneath the law, the Judaizers, while setting himself up as a Jew with accolades that did nothing for his righteousness, but rather, he finds his life's aim to be a participant in Christ. So, at this point in Philippians, Paul lays out his honors and his privileges only to lay them aside because they are nothing in comparison to Jesus, right? So, whenever we take a look at this text, we have, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And this rejoice is not a superficial cheerfulness. Um, it's This should be something that's customary for the Philippians to rejoice, and it's not something that ignores the realities of hardship, but it actually takes into account those hardships, and it recognizes that God is mightily working in and through these circumstances to fulfill his own purposes in Christ. So whenever Paul says rejoice in the Lord, he means rejoice. And the idea of joy is not just some emotive response, but it's a mindset. So he's giving this, this imperative command to, to customarily, to habitually rejoice in the Lord. Um, and as they move along, uh, the object of this rejoicing is the Lord. Uh, And the Lord is where this joy is found. And so you can, you can see this language that, you know, the Psalms use where it's the Lord who saves and he's the basis and focus on joy. 
And so this imperative does not refer to a feeling, but an active activity of the mind and placing your mind on the things of God, hoping and rejoicing in the Lord who is the source of joy. Now, when Paul says to write these same things to you is no trouble to me, uh, this really, um, we tend to think of it as being linked to finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord, right? To write, to have joy is of no trouble to me. What what he's actually pointing to, he's pointing forward. And so he's saying what he's about to say, um, he had taught before and he needs to do it again. Um, And he clarifies and it's safe for you. So what Paul is about to tell them is beneficial to them and it's necessary and it's of no trouble to him. (laughs) If we take him at his, um, at his word. Moving on to verse 2. Um, we see, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Right, And this repetition is purposeful. Um, and it's a simple command that should be um, understood as being iterative. That is continuous, customary, um, and the term here uh, should be understood as beware. Um, consider fall short um, because of the emphasis being placed in this particular passage. So this is a stark warning against these types of people. And so whenever we get to um, the first category, look out for the dogs. Um, it's really an understanding of an infamous person, a dog, right? It's It's kind of slang for someone who is compared to a mad dog. And this was typically used for Gentiles um, to denote kind of like their their pagan lifestyles, their low-life, unclean nature. But Paul flips this, and he points it to the Judaizers, calling them dogs. Uh, so it's quite, quite interesting how he flips the script there. And then he says, look out for the evildoers. Um, so the Judaizers, um, those are the ones who wanted to uh, bring imposition of the law upon Christians, are doing works that are works of the flesh rather than being works of righteousness, despite their perception, right? They think that they're following the law and living righteously. Uh, And Gordon Fee notes in his commentary on Philippians, uh, such people in trying to make Gentiles submit to Torah, that is the law, do not work righteousness at all, but evil, just as those in the Psalter work iniquity because they have rejected God's righteousness in the sense of showing the relationship to him by walking in his ways. And he kind of expands on this. So first we have look out for the dogs, a term usually used for Gentiles, and he flips it on to the Judaizers. Then he calls them evildoers, even though they're Torah observant, if you will. And then look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Um, And what's quite interesting is that this is mutilation cutting in pieces, right? Um, and, and it's a word play to the word for circumcision. And it's basically saying um, a circumcision that results in destruction of some sorts, according to BDAG, which is kind of like the, the Lexus of Greek lexicons. So you have these three categories where these people think that they're doing things correctly, but, but they're not. And then Paul turns around and in verse three says, for we are the circumcision. And now the circumcision includes Gentiles. And only here is it explicitly attributed to Gentiles. And this is placed in juxtaposition to what those in verse 2 are attempting to accomplish. The contrast is between those who mutilate the flesh, uh, which within the Greek Old Testament, that would be understood as what pagans do, mutilate the flesh in this pseudo-circumcision, if you will. But they believe that they're following the Torah. Paul calls it this mutilation of the flesh, while this Christian community comprised of Gentiles and Jews, are the truly circumcised. And while it's implied that this is dealing with salvation, what's predominantly being said here is that these people are identified with God. They are the circumcision, while these other people are those who mutilate the flesh and who are evildoers and dogs. So after this, we get to, for we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. And this the sense of worship is a idea of service. This group of people are identified as having service to God in devotion and living in a way that's pleasing to him. Not only this, but they find their glory in Jesus Christ. Rather than glorying um, in themselves, they have a God-confident boasting that humbles them. Um, some people say big God theology. Their, their God is big and they are small. He increases and they decrease. They look away from themselves and they glory 
in Christ Jesus. They magnify Christ Jesus. They boast Christ, and they put one's full trust and confidence in Jesus, and they serve God by the Spirit, they boast in Him, and they are contrasted with those who boast in the glory of the flesh and Torah. Let me find my spot here. And they put no confidence in the flesh. Um, and so whenever it comes to flesh, uh, we have to understand that the term can be used in different ways. And here it's simply ref- referring to physical exist- existence, right? It's not about the sinful nature um, as we understand it elsewhere. Um, but this doesn't just go um, to merely physical existence, but Jewish national identity. Um, and you can see that contrast already in terms of how he identifies this group of people um, over and against the Christians, right? Uh, the dogs, mutilators of the flesh, etc. Um, and so his point is, is that um, there's a futility in placing one's confidence in anything outside of Christ in a more general sense. Um, and so in this place, it would be um, your your work here on earth in the flesh, as well as your identity in, in whatever nation or ethnic background you have. And so here comes Paul's argument to justify what he's been saying. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And so Paul here says that he has claims to boasting in himself and relying upon himself. He says, my credentials with regards to my Jewish identity are impeccable. They, they are grounds for confidence in the flesh. And I am more than these individuals who are addressing you. And so whenever he says, um, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for this, I have more. Um, and what happens here is quite interesting. Um, so we get to verse five and what you see here is a listing out of his honors. Now, if you remember in our background, we talked about the curses of norm where, where within Philippi, you'd have these honor inscriptions where they would list out all their honors and all their boasting. And Paul lists out his honors here. It first starts with that, which he inherited at birth. And then it's followed by that, which he achieved as an adult. So Paul plays this honor game. He plays the Philippians honor game, the Roman honor game. And he says, look at all these prestiges. But what he does after is quite remarkable. Um, so let's get into this, this list of honors, his curses and norum, uh, beginning with again, uh, those which he inherited at birth. And uh, verse five starts with circumcised on the eighth day. So uh, a male child who was not circumcised on the eighth day is said to have broken the covenant. And this was a marker of being a part of national Israel in the covenant. And so this was a big deal. And so the the Judaizers who were um, pushing for Gentiles to take their circumcision received a second rate circumcision in comparison to Paul. And so he says, hey, I am more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. And then he says, of the people of Israel. Um, And so we really don't need to expand too much beyond that, but behind saying that he is saying that he has the distinctive bloodline and of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, a lot of people uh, will discuss why he chose to include Benjamin here as a way to boast because the tribe of Benjamin wasn't particularly um, outstanding, so to speak. But Joseph Hellerman says that this was a means of underscoring Paul's identity as a true Israelite in the same way that a Roman citizen would utilize their tribes to emphasize their Roman citizenship. Um, Gordon Fee actually compliments this, and he says that while Gentiles could become members of Israel, Paul's membership was a kind whereby he could trace his family's origins, right? He had that pure line. Um, he, um, Gordon Fee also has this view where the tribe of Benjamin was favored as a boast, but there's arguments against that, um, specifically in that the people of Philippi would probably not know that background. Um, so ultimately, the agreement between like Fee and Joseph Hellerman, for example, is that Benjamin is a way of saying that he's by blood someone who is tribally a part of Israel. 
He can link it. He can trace it. He's he's got that on lock. And then we have the Hebrew of Hebrews. Um, so in every way, Paul was born um, from Hebrew stock. He comes from a Hebrew line um, in every respect, especially so in that um, his parents likely brought him up with Hebrew and Aramaic and avoided assimilation of the Gentile environment in Tarsus. Um, and so he is a Hebrew in contrast to being a Hellenistic Jew, a Jew who has adopted Greek customs. While he was educated and had education, he didn't adopt those things that would be characteristic of a Hellenistic Jew, um, but he remained a Hebrew of Hebrews. And then we get to, as to the law of Pharisee, uh, which most of us um, are familiar enough with, but the Pharisees were the religious conservatives who observed the rabbinic and mosaic law strictly and were known for prominent ritual purity and cleanliness. And this particular accolade is significant because it ties him closely to the law. So he has this close relationship to the law, and you have this relationship with a group that was known for study and codification, for observance of the law. And so Paul's not unaware of these things. He's got that link to it. Um, But what's interesting here is that he doesn't see being related to the Pharisees as a term of reproach, but a title of honor. And really, there's, there's, there needs to be a balance in how we observe the Pharisees. In a lot of ways, we only see negatives, but Paul sees being related to the Pharisees as being an honor, something worth mentioning in his cursus honorum. And so that's something we can think about at a later time. But, but Pharisees tend to get a bad rap um, because they were critiqued heavily, but that doesn't mean that they were holistically um, to be thrown out, I guess. Anyway, that's just one of those things. Um, so as to the law of Pharisees, and then next, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Um, and basically, you see this idea of this zeal as someone who's who's just ready to get up and go fight, pursue the enemy, a hunter, maybe tracking down um, you know, his, his prey and, and chasing it down. And so we know that Paul and Romans actually commends the Jews for their zeal, but he just says they have zeal, but they don't have knowledge, right? And so that would be his case here. He had the zeal, he had the devotion, um, and he was a persecutor of the church. And so he lists that as a reason to say, hey, according to the flesh, I can boast. Um, And then as to righteousness underneath the law, blameless. And so he says underneath the law, horizontally, I was blameless, I was, I followed the, I followed the commandments. I followed the, the moral and ritual commandments. And, uh, I was clean according to, uh, the Torah observance, which means that he was really zealous in his adherence to the interpretation of the law from the Pharisees, including the dietary restriction, the Sabbath observance, the ritual cleanliness, etc. Uh, and so this blamelessness just makes this more emphatic about what he's saying here in terms of his means for boasting in the flesh. So that there's our list of curses and norm from Paul. I have reason to boast in the flesh. Here's my, here's my credentials. Here's my accolades. Here's my, here's my glories. And then he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. And so these two terms here, gain and loss are significant. They're accounting terms. Uh, if you imagine a balance sheet, so you're an, an accountant and you have a balance sheet with the columns for assets and liabilities, he says that which was an asset is now counted as a liability for the sake of Christ. It is a damage, it's a disadvantage, it's a loss, it's a forfeit. Um, and so here we see that all of his previous honors and gains are not just indifferent or unimportant now, but they're positively harmful in Paul's pursuit to be in Christ, to know Christ. And he expands on this here in a second, but all of these honors, all these things of the flesh are liabilities in his knowing of Christ because they give him reasons to glory in himself and not glory in Christ. And he just reaffirms this statement. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. So whenever we get here, we see um, this is what is much more valuable the knowledge, the surpassingly great knowledge of Jesus Christ himself. 
And then Paul says that for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And here, um, perhaps it was his disinheritance from his family, um, property, alienation from friends, his status in Judaism or Judaism, um, and all these things that he formerly prized. He, he lost them, but he counts them as rubbish. And when it comes to that word rubbish, there's a lot of discussion. It gets overplayed, I think. Um, it means useless or undesirable material that is subject to uh, disposal. Um, it's garbage. And so it can be used for excrement, um, but it's usually known to be um, a type of garbage that was thrown out for dogs to forage through, right? Um, so this could be taking a shot at the Judaizers further, given what he said about look out for the dogs. And so if he's talking about it's all rubbish, I'm going to throw it to the dogs kind of thing. Um, but that's what he thinks about all of these um, gains he had that he now counts as lost for the sake of knowing Christ. And I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And he's already established that he knows Christ and that he's in Christ. And so he essentially says here that he's not satisfied to just know God forensically and to be placed in a place where, yeah, I'm declared righteous, but he wants to know Christ intimately as well. And so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So Paul says that he is giving up those things that could previously um, be a means of boasting in himself, and he places his desires in Christ. So Christ has his self-surrender. He self-surrenders all of himself and puts himself in Christ. And by putting his trust in self into Christ, Paul is being found in Christ at the expense of those fleshly things that he had given up previously. And this righteousness from God, with God as the source of this righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God via Christ, depends on faith. And then he concludes that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, that comes from God, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so here we see the union with Christ in his death and his resurrection is something that is past, it's currently going, and it will be realized in the future. When you're found in Christ at the end, you're living in that now, and you have died with Christ and been raised into new life. And he says that by any means, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul stresses that the ultimate goal at the expense of all other means of boasting, all other things that may have been um, seen as profit at some point, but are now liabilities. That ultimate goal is to know Christ and be in right relationship with him and to live in the power of the resurrection, to live in the reality of new life because of Christ. And also in all of this, in this passage, we see it's the work of the triune God to bring about salvation. It's not work to the flesh, but participation in Christ being united to his person. So the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to know Christ intimately in the power of his resurrection. And that's where we need to step back and look at all of those things that we consider fleshly gains in this world and ask ourselves, are these acting as liabilities in my growth to know Christ? Are these liabilities that are taking away from the profit of knowing Christ? Is this title doing that to me? Do I need to reevaluate my my accomplishments? Do I need to reevaluate my position in a organization? Do I need to realign who I'm glorying in? Let's glory in Christ. Let's know Christ. Let's follow Paul in making Christ the pursuit of our lives.